pots, there was pot, there was painting. And so that was kind of an important thing. And before Sheila died, she really wanted to see that happen on the lawn at Rowan Trees Pottery. So I think it was 2008, about the time you were coming into the program here. Um, I sponsored 60 children, had free art classes. We did drawing, we did painting, we did pottery. And that was the same year I started teaching school. And about that time, Mr. Phelan was visiting my aunt Sheila. And I had been there day in and day out. When my mother died, I think I took the mail to Sheila six days a week. And so I didn't exactly cross paths with him. He had to deal a lot with my cousin, Anita, who was a huge help to him. And I'm so glad he showed up because he took all of those bits and pieces that had been part of my life and he sewed it together into a book. Um, Dr. Phelan got his master's degree from Pratt, his PhD from New York University. He's traveled extensively and lectured on art, design and art education. I learned so much when I heard him talk about the things I do and why I do them. He's authored several books, including two about Miss Pearson, Following the Brick Path, The Story of Rowan Tree's Pottery. And then he took one of her manuscripts that when he saw it, he really thought that maybe someone else should get to read it, um, to in Tuscany with a donkey. And um, it's a pretty fabulous read. And I thank you, Andrew, for taking those things that are so important to me and making them visible tonight. Thank you very much. And it's been a long time since I've been here, seen people, but um, I spent, uh, actually, Penny says about 2008, uh, when I came into the picture, I actually started coming to Blue Hill and to Rowan Trees about 1998, when I did the first research for the article that appeared in Ceramics Monthly. And then after that, Sheila decided it was okay, and I could do a book. So here we go. <laughs> I suspect many of you are wondering how a guy from Oklahoma, I gotta do this. Blocking my view of the text. I suspect many of you are wondering how a guy from Oklahoma got interested in and spent time researching Adelaide Pearson of Boston and Blue Hill, Maine. Well, as they say, it's personal, or that is to say it runs in the family. To clarify, my father, <coughs> my father knew Adelaide Pearson. My father, Lynn L. Phelan, was the first potter Adelaide and Laura Paddock hired at Rowan Trees Pottery. When I discovered a letter he had written to Sheila Varnum, I started doing some research on his time in Blue Hill. He left a number of his day books with references to his time at Rowan Trees, and that got me started working on an article for the magazine Ceramics Monthly. The research led me to contact Sheila and come to Blue Hill. She enjoyed the article, and then we discussed the book. Over the years I spent researching the book were many hours in the archives at Rowan Trees and many hours at the weekly happy hours that she's bought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, the book came into fruition as following the brick path in 2010. After doing the Rowan Trees book, I inquired about two in Tuscany and she gave me permission to do it. This is from my father's day books, her, his first impressions of uh, Adelaide. Miss Pearson is the kind of person who loves to talk to upset the apple cart, but not necessarily to help put it back, unless she felt like it. Makes a point of playing up her apparent ignorance of pottery and talks endlessly and perpetually of rushing in where angels fear to tread. Calls herself a realist, makes much of her music background and training. I have to say my father's personality was not necessarily in sync with Adelaide's. I suspect they clashed quite a bit. And he dealt more with Laura Paddock than he did with Adelaide because of that. But here's a wonderful young photograph of, of Adelaide, 1910. She was born in Brookline, Mass, the daughter of Charles Henry Pearson, treasurer of the Chelsea Clock Company and a state senator. I should also add here, I don't have it in the text, but I should also add he was also an inventor of munitions. There's a wonderful letter that Adelaide 
wrote back to her father congratulating him on his patent on a, an artillery fuse. And I suspect he made more money from that than he did from his Chelsea Cock Company activities. At a young age, she and her sister Lucy were homeschooled by a tutor under the watchful eye of their mother. She later attended a private day school, but did not attend college. She spoke several languages. She received excellent musical training as a young person, so thoroughly that she wanted to pursue a career in music, but her father nixed that. She claimed to have learned photography, including developing and printing by the age of eight, and she learned to drive a car in 1903. And for a woman to drive a car in 1903 was really saying something. She never married, and as a woman of some means, she made a career out of volunteer work and social and artistic organizations. And indeed, she was very progressive in her politics. As a young adult, Pearson worked with local agencies like the Boston Children's Aid Society, the College Settlement Movement, the Denison House, and she gave lectures at the, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. She also joined the Society of the Companions of the Holy Cross, an Episcopalian lay group, and remained active in it for the rest of her life. And she traveled every year of her life, practically. As previously mentioned, Pearson was a person of considerable means and she owned an apartment in Florence for some years where she spent a good deal of time. In the spring of 1912, she decided to take a trip around the province of Tuscany, of Tuscany, but this was not going to be a routine trip, but a journey in an unlikely conveyance. She embarked on this trip, traveling by donkey cart in the hills of Tuscany. She was accompanied by a woman never identified and referred to in the Signora, and she wrote about this trip in a manuscript that was never published in her lifetime. The manuscript survived over the next century in her Blue Hill home, bound with a shoestring and carefully wrapped. I suspect it's in the archives here. I would think, yes. The manuscript of the story is wonderfully illustrated with Pearson's photographs. She was a very astute and insightful writer and photographer. It contains wonderful observations and insights into life in Tuscany in the early decade of the 20th century. Do you know what a trapolo is? Do you know what it's like to share a room with silkworms? <laughs> very noisy. You can read two in Tuscany and you can find out about those things. The story was dedicated to the donkey who pulled the cart, Nanny. And Nanny was quite a character, quite deserving to have the story dedicated to him. And so the story contains some wonderful insights into the idiosyncrasies of donkeys. Some quite wonderful, some maddening. Adelaide begins the story with a sentence that reads like it was written yesterday. Almost everybody seems to go to Italy nowadays, and at least one person in each group writes a book of Italian notes or days or journeys or cities. She then goes on to explain why and how they came to travel by donkey cart, eschewing the automobiles, even then available to someone of her station. The journey proceeded chapter by chapter in the book, and they sort of wandered, they went north, and then east, and then made a right turn and traveled southward in an arc towards Siena. The story ends rather abruptly in Siena, and this ending leads one to conclude the manuscript remains unfinished. Why, we don't know, but it just, this is the page, this is the last page in the manuscript. Somehow, Nanny and the Trapolo, we and the crowd were disentangled. The home like Pension Santa Clarina was preserved, was reached without further incident and, re, and behold, we were settled in Siena, the first real resting place on our trip. But it's the first real resting place. And that's where she ends the story. That's the cover of the book that uh, came out of the manuscript. Basically, 
basically the, the book is a facsimile of her manuscript. It's, uh, the pages were scanned. They were put in the same order she put them in. I added a few uh, editorial notes in places and provided a forward and an afterward in there. But basically the story is all hers. No editing of what she wrote. Um, no changes at all in how she wrote it. She kept traveling. Two years later, she was in Northern Greece when World War I broke out in 1914. The trip across France just ahead of the German forces was as harrowing as the Tuscany trip was bucolic. She wrote about it in a brief 27 page illustrated manuscript, Getting Home, that was also never published. She kept extensive scrapbooks of her trips and a number of leather covered binders with those such as shown here. Some were hand tooled leather. Also shown here are a couple of the scrapbook pages of her photographs from the 1914 trip. These were carefully saved by Sheila Varnum at Rowan Tree's Pottery under the care of Anita Babson Campbell, who at that point was serving as the unofficial keeper of files and records. During World War I, Adelaide served with the Red Cross, sometimes as an ambulance driver. <clears throat> Pearson returned to Italy in her Florence apartment after the war ended. She traveled again to Italy and there are some wonderful pictures of the Bacolic countryside and some pictures of early fascist rallies. While she kept her apartment, Pearson continued to make her home in Brookline in Boston and actively participated in social work and volunteer activities there. And in 1922, she published a book, The Laughing Lion, based on her children's lectures at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It's a wonderful story or series of stories. In the 1920s, she began to travel to North Africa, including Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, and what was then Palestine. She was present at some of the Egyptian tomb openings of this period. And here are some of the pages from her scrapbooks. Wonderful photographs in all these, by the way. Just really, really wonderful photographs. This is one of her photographs, not of the opening of the tombs, but of, of the travels. She was a great photographer. She was just terrific. She was also very adventuresome in her travels, as this picture of her riding in a track vehicle on the dunes demonstrates. Some additional pages from the scrapbooks of these years. And then she started, she liked North Africa, and as she returned there a number of times over the next decade, she expanded her visual documentation not only taking photographs, but now making films. And here are some clips from several trips. Again, I would just note that as a woman and traveling by herself or with another woman, she was very, very, very adventuresome. That's the first, there are gonna be some more of these. In 1933, Adelaide and several friends took a trip to South America, then traversed the Panama Canal and went up the west coast of Mexico and the US to San Francisco. 
Following the death of her father in 1925, her mother had died earlier. She left Brookline and moved to Blue Hill where she had inherited her maternal grandparents' home on 84 Union Street. Growing up, she spent a great deal of time there and loved it. So it seemed appropriate for her to choose it as her home, which she made her home for the rest of her life. Blue Hill was then a very small summer community for well-to-do Bostonians and New Yorkers. The local economy was, and it may still be, I don't follow your local economy, but it quite dependent on the summer residents. After moving there and adopting Blue Hill as her home, social reformer that she was, she set about improving the lives of the year-round residents. Initially, she gave lectures on art and culture and set about improving the local library, which was then a very small ladies' social library housed in the town hall. Believing in a strong library as a cultural anchor, she paid the salary the first time librarian, and then activist that she was, she organized a fundraising campaign using her considerable political skills and connections. She raised 20,000 in private funds, and then an additional 15,000 from the Public Works Administration, and then followed up on that later on with other things. And the result is the library you're sitting in. The foundations were those that Adelaide put together. In 1934, she began offering summer art and craft classes for children in the residents of Blue Hill and Hancock County on the spacious grounds of her home. The classes were a hit. I watched the art classes this afternoon here and uh, they were quite sedate compared to what you're gonna see here. I don't think you could do that on the front lawn of the library. <laughs> Yeah. 
A couple of years later, some of the students wanted their ceramic pieces fired, so she built a kill. A woman named Laura Paddock, trained at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, came to teach ceramics for two weeks, and she stayed the rest of her life. People wanted to buy the fired ceramic pieces created in the summer classes, so the women decided there might be an economic opportunity for the community by making and selling pottery. Pearson thought they might provide year-round jobs to Blue Hill residents if they operated a, pyre, a pottery. So they did. First named Rowan Trees Kill, it later became the Rowan Trees Potter. Interestingly, the establishment of the kill was a social experiment for the purposes of providing employment for the local residents. They were also committed to using local resources. Laura Paddock developed local sources for both the clay and the glazes. Pearson promoted the economic benefits of using Maine's natural resources in the making of pottery. And although Rowan Tree's pottery was established to enhance the local economy, the women still struggled with its development since they could not find local workers with appropriate skills and training. And they concluded they needed to initiate a program to train the workers. They went looking for professional help. They first contacted Alfred University and its world famous New York State College of Ceramics, but they didn't find the assistance they wanted there. They then turned to Professor, Professor Arthur Baggs, a graduate of Alfred and head of the ceramics program at Ohio State University. He also owned and was the chief designer of Marblehead Pottery and Marblehead Mass. Bags recommended one of his recent graduates, Lynn Alfielen, to the women. In the fall of 1937, Fielen went to Blue Hill and worked at Rowan Trees for the next two years, producing his own pottery for Rowan Trees, teaching in the Blue Hill High School, and training the workers before leaving to start his own pottery. Progress in developing a market for the Rowan Trees wear was uneven. But a year later, the women felt secure enough to plan a worldwide trip to England and the Far East that would last from the fall of 1938 to May of 1939. On that trip, Adelaide and Laura Paddock first went to England, then to India and the Far East, including Indonesia, Indochina, Japan, and China. The purpose of the trip was twofold. First, to investigate potteries and finding a model which would help them develop rowan trees. Secondly, to attend the Women's World Congress in India. They, they went to, I've forgotten which pottery in England uh, initially, but one of the ones that was very successful. And then they went on to the Far East. And of course, Pearson took photographs and films. Somewhere of sightseeing. By the way, these are, if you look at the dates of these, these are very early color photographs quite remarkably early, actually. And I would also add that uh, those of you who are used to carrying very sophisticated pieces of equipment in your pocket, the cameras that she would have had to lug would have been huge and would have been quite cumbersome. And she would have had to plan very carefully to get them into and out of places where they were traveling. They're great photographs, great films. Previous set of film was really the, the uh, touring films, the tourist type things. These are where they really studied how, in fact, you'll see Laura get involved here in a minute.
this man was a <clears throat> very, very famous potter at that time, uh, ceramicist, and he a colleague of Bernard Leach, who was perhaps the most famous ceramicist of that time. Pearson also made what are believed to be the earliest color motion pictures of Gandhi. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have those. I believe they're in the Northeast Film Archive. Um, I have this one still photograph in black and white that she took, but uh, she apparently took the first color photographs of Gandhi. After India, the women continued on to Indochina, Japan, and China before returning home in the early summer of 1939. That was just before the war. Her photographs of China include some hints of the horror to come in World War II. Shortly after the ladies returned, World War II broke out. During the war, Pearson could not travel as much as she would have liked, so she devoted much time and energy to building up the sales of the pottery. Rowan Tree's pottery began to prosper during the war as Americans cut off from the traditional markets for ceramics, Europe and Asia turned to buying American made products. After the war, the pottery began selling very well in America House, B. Altman's, Marshall Fields and other large department stores. In 1955, the pottery was selected to make place settings for President and Mrs. Eisenhower. And it eventually opened its own New York City sales room, but that didn't work out. During the war, since she couldn't travel as freely as before, she still traveled to, by train and car to Mexico. And after the war ended, even though she was then in her 70s, she resumed her travels. And all her travels, she collected art and artifacts, filling the Blue Hill House with their collection. These are some of the samples from the estate sale brochure that followed her death. Somewhat fittingly, she died on her last trip to Mexico in 1960 and was buried there. And if you read the obituary here, note the reference to the library and her contributions to the building of this library and in creating the card catalog. Very hands-on. Her legacy, from my perspective, is found in a number of things she established, the Blue Hill Library, Rowan Trees Pottery, her films, her photographs, Two in Tuscany, The Laughing Lion. And from my perspective, besides the Blue Hill Library, her other great legacy was Rowan Trees Pottery. After Pearson's death in 1960, it was run by her partner, Laura Paddock, 19, or 1889 to 1980, until 1975 when it was taken over by Sheila Varnum, uh, Sheila Varnum 1925 to 2012, who had started working there in 1940. Rowan Trees Pottery closed just a few years before Sheila's death in 2009. That said, Pearson's travel, scrapbooks, letters, photographs, and films provide a wonderful window into the world of the period between the wars. They too are a treasure. Her films are in the Northeast Film Archive and her papers, scrapbooks, et cetera, are now in the Blue Hill Library. And Rowan Tree's pottery pieces are avidly collected. So I'd like to thank Anne Zamba, who wrote about Adelaide as an art educator and who shared her article and research with me. And a very special thank you to Kimberly Tarr, who skillfully transferred Adelaide's films to the digital format and donated them to the Northeast Film Archive, where they are preserved for future generations. And I think Sheila Barnum has owed a very special thank you, and everyone in the Blue Hill community should be aware of the special care she gave to Adelaide's legacy, ensuring her contributions to Blue Hill remain safely intact. She looked after those very assiduously. She kept them very carefully stored and was very, very aware of the legacy and very, very aware of her role as a caretaker of that legacy. 
And finally, my thanks here to Malcolm Purvis and the other members of the library committee who made it possible for me to make this presentation and to Rich Boulette, the director of the library. Thank you for watching. Questions? I'm sorry? The sign in the corner that says the latest from the library. Right from that corner. That was the original. Rich, you want to add to that? Well, that actually hung on the door of the uh, library's bookmobile. If you pull it down, it has these little hooks on the back of it. Does it travel for all hours? How small is the movie? 16 or something. Something, and that travels to each movie. Could you talk a little more about the films that she produced? Obviously, the, the text that appeared with them. Was that part of her plan, uh, her outreach, or was it something that was put together later on? Say that again. The film clips that I showed. The film clips. The film clips I showed were taken from uh, quite a number of films, and I just selected some that I thought would go well in a presentation like this, and that Kimberly Tarr made available to me. Um, I guess my idiosyncrasies played a role in that, but I mean, there's, there's a she had, she made a great number of films. I wondered if she uh, if any of her films were shown i mean did she do showings of her films not that i know back? of uh, not that i know of they no. were made as far as i know she made the films for her own her own i, I guess benefit uh, to record the trips that she was on the same way she kept the photographic scrapbooks and her notes she wrote about trips too there was a, there's a massive material that she documented uh her own travels and her own actions and well, well, she would come back from trips and would give lectures at the Village Improvement Society in Eureka and talk about her trips and what was important. She also brought back artifacts. But it, there's a good chance that she showed some of those films. At those meetings? Yeah, that. okay. And then there was a team told us. Peter O'Brien told me where they told us about the gallery. So that was offered up at the gallery for pottery and children would be invited as a young man to not appreciate being dressed up and made to tell a history about these travels. So I think that was part of some of the things that she did. So as part of the library and everything else, there was much provision to bring back our students. She loved documenting what she was doing. She just, she really loved doing it. She spent a, an inordinate amount of time taking photographs and making films and writing things down and, and uh, carefully save them. Other questions? Where is my other question? Where in Mexico is your trip? I'm sorry, <laughs> you're with your mask. Where in Mexico is your grave? Um, I was curious about it. I for, I've forgotten. It, it, it was a place she went to many Many times, um, she traveled. Yeah, the, she traveled. The last couple of times she went there, she traveled in a wheelchair. She was determined to go. I was just telling someone that Sheila wanted me to go find her grave. Oh, did she? <laughs> well, that I mean, that, that's interesting you say that because that's that's that that really is indicative of of Sheila's devotion to preserving the legacy. Exactly. Seriously. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> Do you know what month she died? The what? What month she died? In, in 1950. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it was in the obituary, but I don't. I don't remember what. I'm curious because I think I remember that she sent a hundred dollar check when I graduated from high school and that was my last check. Other questions? Well, 
thank you all for coming. So there is going to be a small reception in the Wilder Room if you'd like to join us. There will be drinks. I guess I should say that. <laughs> also fabulous things to look at. Yes, yes, that as well. Do you want to disengage? That? Yes, I will do that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know what? We're just going to unhook that and I will. Yeah, I'm glad someone did it.